So thank you for coming, and I'm very excited really to, to share with you what, what has been keeping me up at night for a year. Um, I would start by saying that the world we inhabit was conceived in the laboratory. The lamp of the projector beaming these slides, the microchip inside your smartwatch, the code behind the transmission signal of your cell phone, the plastic bottle you drank water from on the plane here, even the life-sustaining drugs you might have taken this morning were all developed in some kind of a laboratory. And architecture is no exception. The fire retardant panels that cover the ceiling of this amphitheater, the chemical composition of the paint that covers these walls, the mechanical properties of the very plush polyurethane foam you're sitting on comfortably, were all developed and tested in some kind of a laboratory. In fact, modern life as we know it was conceived in the laboratory. The built world in its totality has become a space of testing. So one has to ask, how did we get here? The exhibition Lab Cult, an unorthodox history of interchanges between science and architecture, explores precisely this question. It investigates the concept of the laboratory as a pervasive and recurring place and idea for experimentation in both science and architecture, and as a space for the conduct of rigorous research. The lab has been an incredibly productive idea for both of these fields, for both science and architecture, uh, but I would argue that in, the, in this process it has also developed into a kind of cult, a kind of unquestioned dogma that I wish to look into further. So, the seeming credibility of laboratories um, has been repeatedly mobilized on the flip side of the story to normalize social behaviors, to discipline the performance of bodies, to regulate our environments, or even standardize the ways we live. And now we'll stop, stop reading. So for those familiar perhaps with the, wor the work of um, sociologist of science, Bruno Latour, Laboratory Life, um, this is a kind of double entendre for the title. Uh, Latour did a pioneering study into looking how laboratories actually work. And laboratories are not just spaces or instruments tucked away. They're actually a combination of architecture, people, and instrumentation. And in this process, you know, of uh, trying to shed light on the unexplored workings of science, um, science itself, since the Enlightenment, has kind of created a replacement for um, religion uh, that has uh, led us to this present moment. Labs have been described as the cathedrals of science, as you must have heard, or the locations where the truths of nature are revealed, or even as truly metaphysical spaces. And the laboratory, the concept itself, has been one of the most powerful contributions of architecture to science. Originating in the Latin verb laborare, to work, the laboratory was conceived as an architecture dedicated to a specific way of working, a seemingly more consistent and credible way of working. The first science to acquire its own space was actually chemistry. But beyond the definition of the physical space of the laboratory, or, it has also been used as a metaphor, as a, as a kind of analogy or allegory for uh, rigorous, objective, and precise research. So I thought for the purposes of this project, it would make sense to explore these dimensions rather than just stick to the architecture of the laboratory. So instead of looking at buildings, actually look at how the idea works. So we find ourselves at a very interesting time today, I find, where uh, in places like uh, the United States right now, um, political regimes clearly contest you know, the credibility of science or even our capacity to verify scientific phenomena like global warming. And I find it very fascinating that at the very same moment, think tanks, architectural schools, design institutions, firms are completely saturated with design labs, all of which promise to do one thing, and that is to, pre to develop precise solutions to design challenges of the contemporary moment. This can be traced back all the way to the early 20s, if, and much earlier, in fact. But in architecture, a very clear moment see, is actually when um, Bauhaus moves to Dessau in 1926, uh, and Gropius, on the cover of this uh, uh, first page of uh, the, news uh, the newspaper of the Bauhaus, uh, explains that the workshops will not longer be workshops, but they will actually be laboratory workshops for the science and architecture. <laughs> 
So if this is a previous way of training the architect, the Beaux-Arts model, uh, uh, where everybody's in, in a big uh, space uh, sculpting, drawing, sketching, working with models, etc. Uh, this approach put is, puts a huge X and it tries to make a break with the past and to create a new scientist in a way, the architectural scientist. And along with that comes a change in the whole practice of the profession and the research and the practice. So if the old atelier was the one that when one gets dusty and wears the, the overcoat for painting, one replaces that overcoat with the lab coat. So another idea that is very much tied to the idea of the lab is the idea that of the research enclave. So laboratories are often seen as these kind of isolated islands uh, where research takes place. For example, this is a neutrino observatory in Japan. This is a floating pool photographed by Andreas Kurski. And as the places where all the secrets, you know, are kind of revealed. If we go back to the definition of the laboratory, at the moment it crystallizes during the Enlightenment, and this is a fantastic um, a spread from uh, Diderot's Encyclopédie from the collection of the CCA. One sees that, uh, as I mentioned, the laboratory is not just a, a research enclave that is individual from the world, but it's actually very much in conversation with it. So what you might see here is the interior of a, a chemistry laboratory, the first science to acquire its own space. But the description that one gets in the, in the script is that um, the laboratory has to communicate with the world, has to ensure that material can get in and out, um, or that it has an impact uh, beyond itself. And if you look further down the definition, for me it was super fascinating to see that the laboratory is primarily defined by architectural characteristics. It has to be wide, it has to be open, it has to have a chimney for the furnaces, it has to have spaces for workers, for people to, to, to go up and down stairs. And that understanding you know, made me uh, think, how did architects think about um, this uh, definition? Again, in the kind of early process of the research here at the CCA, and I'm going to show you many of the outtakes rather than what you're going to see in the exhibition. Um, I came across, let's say, this uh, sketch by Ms. van der Rohe on um, the minerals and metals research building at the IIT in Chicago. And you see that the vision of the lab, that there's a little inscription over there, is the kind of interior that is enclosed, that there's one lonely figure that is there to, to, to work these things out. And the photography of this space as it's built, it kind of builds up on the same idea. You even see that there's this kind of frosted glassing that uh, prevents someone to, 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 to look beyond what is this interior space. But in one way or another, laboratories are also places to look at the world, even if, if that is looking through an aquarium built by Etienne Jules Marais in order to photograph aquatic life inside uh, the section of a wall. So here you have, for example, a scientist creating a super architectural intervention in order to devise a setup for his own research. When Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, discovered the microbes at the end of 19th century, he, he made that discovery inside his laboratory. But what he did was effectively change the whole world around us. All the regimes that we have of hygiene today came out of this laboratory but have completely changed not only our daily practices, but even the architecture of um, daily life. So by going to the field and getting you know, to the samples of um, the microbes, uh, Pasteur would return back to his laboratory, perform a scale up, and then return to the world to have an effect on it. And that's something that I think is super interesting when thinking um, about the effect of architectural laboratories. Laboratories are always political. An example, a contemporary example of what I just explained would be the IKEA laboratory testing lab um, in Sweden. So what you see here, you know, if, if we didn't have a caption, you might have mistaken it perhaps for a biological laboratory or biochemical. In fact, it's a place where more than 2,000 products by uh, IKEA are tested and developed every year. So the chemical compositions, the materials, um, the, the range of options, uh, the designs, the mechanical properties, are tested, adjusted, uh, regulated, disseminated, and eventually are you know, distributed across the world to more than 470 uh, locations. So what you, you, know, uh, what you touch as the last object before you go to bed has actually been engineered in some kind of space like this. And the perception of option that we have is actually determined by these choices that have been made a lot of times in the absence of us or in the absence of architects even. Today, the curricula and exercises taught at architecture schools 
around the world are still indebted to 19th century experiments on visual perception and motor skills. And here you see an example from MIT. Contemporary understandings of ergonomics and spatial efficiency, which find applications from office environments to kitchens in our homes, can be traced back to the theories of scientific management that influence a generation of modernist architects. Present day theories of climate control and sustainability are based on the early use of physical models in wind tunnel testing by architects and scientists. Or similarly, the proliferation of surveillance technologies that extract information from our behavior in space, from um, uh, face recognition cameras to the algorithms that select the uh, ads that appear on our newsfeed, cannot be understood without the development of developmental psychology, sorry, behavior psychology, which fascinated both physicians and architects um, at the cusp of the century. And even our daily interaction with sensor control systems, which are infiltrating architecture and are everywhere from automatic doors to elevators to even uh, bathroom flashes and thermostats, cannot be understood outside the theory of cybernetics that was popularized in the 40s and the 50s. So I would argue that in order to re-engineer any of these experiments that are you know, played upon us on a daily basis and their consequences, one needs to go back to their inception. One needs to go back to their origins and see how this interaction happened. The exhibition uh, is organized around six pairings. Every pairing compares one case from the world of architecture with one case from the world of science. The different um, pairings that you see here on the screen are designing instruments, measuring movement, visualizing forces, testing animals, building models, and observing behavior. But rather than using the traditional art historical understanding of influence, where the world of science you know, infiltrates into architecture and produces a new kind of architecture, I would like to you know, try test the idea of having a more reciprocal relationship, having a more symmetric narrative of these two that doesn't prioritize one discipline or the other. Now, this research was carried out at the CCA, obviously, and I'm going to talk about it in depth. But uh, I thought, you know, while building up the argument of, of the first case, it became apparent that one needed to step away also and, and, and uh, bring different objects and juxtapose them against the collection and construct the argument through this uh, counter juxtaposition, actually. So this research has led us to more than 20 different archives and uh, museums, scientific institutions, and in the end, more than 12 of them actually helped contribute to the exhibition. As a first kind of example, I'm going to guide you through three of the pairings very quickly. The first one would be about uh, building models and not designing instruments. <laughs> and it's the comparison between the case of Marvin Minsky, cognitive, sci cognitive scientist at MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and the architect Cedric Price and his project called Generator. So for those of you familiar with Cedric Price, um, the generator project is one of the most uh, radical projects that he ever devised, in my opinion, and um, it's actually part of the CCA collection. It was designed as a, a holiday retreat for artists communities in uh, Florida, and uh, what you see here is a plain planner view of the site model. Now, instead of designing a fixed building in, in time and space, uh, Price had this incredible idea of creating this prefabricated cubicles that be, could, could be rearranged in space, that could be adapted to the users. So it's a much more kind of socially responsive uh, architecture rather than something that is cemented in time. So all the little cubes you see here could be rearranged according to the desires of the users. So if somebody, you know, would have a quarrel with their spouse, they could sleep at separate, separate bedrooms for that evening. And the idea was that users would be able to fit their ideas and, and their desires for the spatial arrangement into a computer, which would guide a, co a mobile controllable um, uh, crane that would rearrange architecture in one-to-one -one scale. I really like this project. But this idea of having all these cubes that are being um, manipulated in space cannot be understood without looking at the parallel um, developments in robotics at the time. So somebody like Marvin Minsky, who worked at the MIT Architectural Laboratory during the late 60s, 
would try to teach a robot how to see objects in space and how to uh, assemble them. You know, it's a very, very simple sol problem for us to reach for something, but it's not for a robot. And what is really fascinating to me is that the way he did that was through architecture. And this is one of the cases that is explained in detail also in the exhibition. The way to teach a robot how to see things and how to recognize and, and, and uh, manipulate them is by teaching it how to do architecture, how to build columns, uh, tables, arches, and other kind of uh, primary architectural uh, types. So this is a kind of pairing that I, you know, uh, is a kind of unorthodox. There's not necessarily a direct influence, uh, uh, but they all speak from the same you know, kind of historical background. And if I was you know, to do a very kind of a disciplinary history and I would stick to the architectural world, I would have a lot of other references for it. But I think that the juxtaposition of the two helps us understand something about the mutual interrelationship between the two cultures. Another pairing that could be interesting to show to you would be about measuring movement. And this is about the, the beginning of the century and the idea of scientific management and its effects on uh, design of spaces. So on the one hand, we have the case of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, two American as, um, um, engineers, who uh, developed this device that they called the chronocyclograph in order to trace the movement of workers while they perform different tasks. So here you see, for example, um, in the previous slide, you saw somebody uh, collating papers uh, on a desk. And here you see the chronocyclograph in motion. And what's interesting, again, you know, trying to see how uh, the architects worked as scientists and scientists worked as architects. The Gilbreths intentionally studied all these things, you know, in a very gridded environment in order to uh, be able to make these measurements uh, um, legible afterwards. But also they used, for example, here, uh, stereography and stereophotography uh, to produce a, a document of this experiment that can recreate the actual space of, of viewing it in real life. So these two photographs, one is the inefficient work uh, study and one of the efficient work study, um, are actually um, uh, originals that have been loaned from the Eastman Museum and are in the gallery for you to play with and look at. And based on these motion studies, the Gilbreths would build models that would uh, uh, demonstrate the correct way of performing a, a simple task on, on one's desk. So a combination of using the, the stereo photograph and the architectural model of the motion in space, uh, the Gilbreths argued would be the way to retrain workers in order to eliminate unnecessary motion, uh, decrease fatigue, but also increase productivity for you know, um, the employer. And in order to bring these two cases, you know, every time the architectural and the scientific more closely together, or actually increase the ambiguity that is inherent in them, uh, we commissioned a series of drawings um, uh, that were designed by new affiliates, uh, a very young and experimental research design firm in New York by Evie Diamandopoulou and Jaffer Kolb. And Evie is here with us tonight, and I'm very happy for it. Uh, in order to exactly showcase how the, the, the whole setup of scientific research cannot be understood without its uh, architectural uh, uh, dimensions. So here you have the setup with a grid, the camera, and the model produced. And a few years later, Margarete Schutte-Lehotzky, a uh, German architect, developed um, what became known as the Frankfurt Kitchen. The Frankfurt Kitchen was a very compact kitchen that very much is the model that we are using today for kitchen design. Previously to that, uh, kitchens would be very kind of dark spaces. They would have a huge stove, a table perhaps in the middle. The idea that we have is a standardized kitchen with cabinets in the periphery, that they have a very kind of ergonomically uh, scaled uh, working area. All those ideas come from this very early history of scientific management in architecture. And the way that uh, Lihotsky designed this kitchen was that she conducted her own kind of time studies and filmed them, like you see here, and then eventually create a design that would minimize the so-called triangle uh, uh, of uh, step um, um, distance in the kitchen. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that 99% of the kitchens that we all use here daily is indebted to the same kind of principles. So it's interesting for me to see how this is a kind of much more direct influence as Lihotsky cites the Gilberts as a, one of the sources of um, uh, inspiration for her work. 
on how this idea of the light rays of uh, the mechanical mechanized observable body in space can actually be transformed into an architectural choreography of the body in space. And in the exhibition, you'll see that every time at the end of uh, each presentation, there, uh, there is this kind of um, comparative juxtaposition of these two drawings that I talked about. And third, and this is the last kind of uh, case I would like to show uh, a, a bit more in depth to explain the, the background process. It's all about designing instruments. And uh, this is a comparison between the Harvard Psychological Laboratory at the end of 19th century uh, operating from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Fukutema School of Architecture in Moscow. Now, as I explained to some of uh, the people in the room here today earlier, one of the gems that I consider are uh, part of the CCA collection is this remarkable uh, set of 470 photographs of student work from the Futema School um, taken in between 1920 and 1930. So uh, this was, you know, when, when I came the first time as a researcher, even, not even a, for this project, this is one of the first kind of objects that I asked to, requested to, to have a closer look because they are really kind of unique in the world. And as you see, they, they are small photographs of uh, models of testing exercises, of uh, studies about uh, uh, depth, perception, surface, etc. The laboratory at Futema School of Architecture was run by Nikolai Ladovsky, a very famous architect from the rationalist group and educator. And what, you, what is actually um, uh, remarkable is that Ladovsky tried to rationalize the process of the teaching architectural design to large groups of incoming students. So here you see an exhibition, for example, of the outputs of his pedagogy, which included um, a series of uh, plaster models that would uh, allow one to understand the perception of volume, weight, and mass. But his ideas cannot be understood without reading you know, the way he was influenced by the studies at Harvard. So here, for example, you see in the interior of the Harvard Psychological Laboratory where applied psychology uh, experiments were carried out at the late 19th century. So the Harvard lab was a place where Hugo Munsterberg, a German uh, um, scientist and psychologist, would design and invent new instruments for the study of perception. Here, for example, you see a study on the dizziness induced by the, the um, um, sorry, the localization the effects of dizziness on the localization of sound. So they would actually make people really dizzy and see if they could perceive where the different uh, sound um, they were subjected to would come from. Or similarly, as you see in the corner over there, they would perform tests on sight and vision and try to decipher the ways in which the human eye perceives color, why different people see colors differently, uh, how do we understand that an object is near or far, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the very kind of creepy uh, little instruments that are part of the laboratory. So this is a little device with uh, weights that uh, connects the two eyes and the way that they rotate together. And this mechanical understanding of the eye was also translated in other demonstration models. So not just testing models, but demonstration models like the Horopter model that you see here, which is included in the exhibition. The Horopter is the geometrical line that is uh, con constructed out of the, all the points in one's field of vision that hit the retina of the eye to construct an image. It's a kind of complicated idea, but if you see in plan, if you imagine in plan these two eyes at the bottom, uh, the red and yellow lines are representing the two viewing cones of um, each of the eyes, and the intersection point in between is the area where we see uh, double, uh, essentially. So this kind of mechanical understanding of the eye it, it comes to replace a kind of older understanding of uh, um, the eye of inspiration or the eye of the behold, you know, in, in whose the, eye, uh, the beauty belongs to the eye of the beholder. I messed that up. Uh, in other words, it, it, it's, it's a kind of iatromechanical model rather than just one of instinct or um, uh, philosophical interpretation of medicine. And again, it's super fascinating to me that you see that the medium to communicate this to his students from Munsterberg was actually through models, real sized models, like this plastic model, which is an amazing section model, in fact. So Ladovsky soaks all these ideas and takes them back to, to, to Russia in the 1920s, where he receives a, an incredible number of students coming from the countryside to be trained in architecture with no previous training. <laughs> 
So he starts designing and inventing his own instruments for trying to assess you know, the dexterities of students and to be able to track the process of 400 individual students. So for example, he de devises a, a so-called angle eye meter where two strings are rotated every time and students are requested to calculate the angle by visual means alone. Or this is one of my favorites, um, three different vessels uh, uh, of different shapes that would be filled up with the same amount of liquid and uh, students would be asked to uh, per, you know, calculate what percentage of uh, them is full or not. Or even you know, the idea that I talked um, um, about color earlier. If these are the instruments that you see at Harvard, a series of architectural uh, models and wheels on a table that you see here uh, in a contemporary photo, are also transposed in the School of Architecture as means for uh, teaching the perception of color to students. And perhaps the most exciting devices of all was the space o meter that you see here on the right, a device on which two, different, two models of the same form would be placed at different angles. A student would sit at the little uh, uh, stand at the front, and they would be requested to, to calculate the, the degree of the two uh, planes. So the idea is that using a talent report form here on, on, the, on the left, one would be able to trace, you know, who are the students who are doing well in this kind of experiment or in the other, which skills they need to hone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I know this sounds a bit creepy, and it is in a way, because on the one hand, there is the intention and a desire to be able to systematize something that is very subjective, uh, but at the same time, that creates many limitations that reduces people to the numberings on that form, or it actually excludes people from uh, entering a school based on very systematized tests. And I think that's something for anyone who's been in architecture or any grad school today can identify with that in, in some degree. So the juxtaposition of these cases, which is actually for me was the very first uh, uh, case where I thought combining science and architecture uh, in the same space would create this argument, brings together these two different institutions, one on the east coast of the US and one in Soviet Russia, and actually shows that the, the infiltration of the ideas on each other are very in, in interlinked. And to my knowledge, uh, as I mentioned earlier also in the gallery, I, I, I don't think that the, the two have ever been exhibited together before. Uh, there's many scholars and there, that have talked about it and written about it very eloquently. And one of them is actually Anya Bokov, who is going to give a, a very much more sophisticated presentation than mine um, in a few days. But it's actually really impressive that what, what you can do in the context of a paper or a book uh, is very different than what you can, you can do in the physical space of the exhibition. Then I would like to you know, finish off with a couple of words about the experience of working under the Emerging Curator Program at the CCA. I have to confess that the moment that I thought about this idea and applying to the program was actually in the galleries of the CCA. I came to see, I, I came to speak at a conference at McGill and um, the other architect curated by Giovanna Borazzi was on. And I had been thinking about the idea of the laboratory, sketching some things, you know, um, uh, taking notes, collecting material. And it's one of those words that, you know, I, I really dare you, once you, you have it in your head and you go out, you'll find it everywhere. Um, so I was going around the exhibition, and one of the cases by, on um, Giancarlo De Carlo was about his um, uh, his own um, um, Elaud, which was uh, a laboratory for architecture and urban design that he de he developed as an alternative model to another architectural institutional school of architecture, and that kind of word on the wall was a kind of you know a, 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 a sort of epiphany, you know, one, one of those thoughts that you have at 3 a.m. and you think they're great. But then I woke up the next day, and it still, you know, sounded like a good idea. So I proposed the, 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 this project very passionately to the CCA, and uh, I was very happy to, 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 to be selected and be, come here and be in conversation. What I didn't say, you know, expect was that um, working with a team and interacting you know, with everybody, looking at the collection, completely changed a lot of the, a lot of the fir first um, ideas I had. I remember, you know, Mirko Giardini asked me two questions and I had to th throw away 60% of my research. <laughs> but he, he didn't ask for it, I, I did it myself. But I thought, you know, um, this is actually a good way of being able to, to develop the project. And one of the great luxuries of the CCA, beyond the material that I just showed, 
is that it's this you know fantastic co combination of a research center and library that has an incredible collection, um, the architecture collection itself, the photographic collection, the museum, the bookshop, everything comes together um, in in a kind of synergetic way. So a lot of the background research that I did was not necessarily um, on show, but it was informed by you know requesting all these super rare and old books that. Uh, Madame Lambert had started collecting, and some of them, you know, for example, the um, Encyclopédie by Denis Diderot that I showed earlier with his amazing marbled papers, or just showing you, you know, this incredible um, bind, bound version of Euclid, Vitruvius, and Durer, where you can find traces of uh, bioclimatic design, in this case, how uh, the wind patterns affect different, the, the orientation of, of cities and grids. Or even, you know, the newspaper designed by Elder Sitsky that was printed in a thousand copies and in which Ladovsky published for the first time the idea for the announcement of an architectural laboratory. Or even going through the periodicals of the post-war and the uh, period, for example, which trace the, the changing paradigms on the understanding of what is an architectural studio. So suddenly you see all these places that are called design laboratories instead of, you know, atelier or workshop or whatever else. And this, you know, it, it, w once you start looking at this, it, can, it kind of becomes an obsession and you see it everywhere. You see it in advertisement. This is one advertisement, for example, for painting from arts and architecture. You see it in the way that ma construction materials are advertised as uh, um, things that have been uh, verified uh, for their efficacy or for their performance. Things that you can try yourself, uh, such as, for example, casting, you know, poop pourings, uh, acids or... Uh, you know, harmful substances on, on a concrete, on a um, uh, tile floor uh, that's made of uh, uh, floor, uh, bricks that can be used both in the laboratory but also in domestic architecture. So there is a kind of very intense crossover between these cultures, especially in the immediate post-war period, that then goes into a kind of long winter beco be before being resuscitated at the present moment. And this is my last piece, I, I promise. I think you know the the whole uh, kind of um, 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 research in a way has been um, leading up to this idea of cross dressing in a way. So if if science produced uh, a new kind of architect, architecture also produced and shaped a new kind of um, scientist at this time. So for example, I thought I, th I thought you know just working also on the drawings with uh, uh, Evie and Jaffer. And going through the images, it became increasingly apparent that more and more architects wished uh, to dress in lab coats, and more and more scientists appeared in three-piece suits in their, you know, environments. For example, here, Nikola Tesla in this uh, spaghetti of sparkles, sitting very nonchalantly, uh, you know, reading his papers. Or here, are, for example, um, Hungarian architects Victor and Alada Olgai that are featured in the exhibition at the Princeton Architectural Laboratory. And this is you know, a kind of image that is, you know, is given for circulation. It's meant for dissemination in the daily Princetonian. So it's a very conscious choice to appear in this kind of armature. And then again, you have it, someone like Etienne Jules Marais in his own uh, laboratory in Paris with all this paraphernalia and, and you know, incredible instruments, again, dressed up in a suit. But perhaps the, the figure that, uh, of all of them that I really identify with most would be Cedric Price. <laughs> so Cedric Price showed up at the exhibition of his own work called The Evolving Image at Ribas Heinz Gallery in 1975. And he showed up wearing a lab coat but what I find fascinating is that he wore a certain kind of safety goggles which were wiper goggles. And I think the goggles are very important because they actually help, in a way, wipe away uh, the, 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 what is the hindrance in front of you and help you see beyond the discipline, but also see beyond the confines of the laboratory. I mean, who else would collage themselves in their own projects wearing this kind of outfit, the lab coat with the safety goggles? And 
what I find fascinating, in having gone through the archive of uh, Price here at the CCA, is the fact that he's something, someone who's extremely interested in meticulous research. His uh, archives are full of these um, questionnaires and compatibility charts and uh, obsessive you know, documentation of things. He produced way too much paperwork and, and precise measurements for all the projects he was doing. But at the same time, he always had this dimension that went beyond the very strict understanding of what science or precision might mean. So here you have a compatibility chart for deciding the adjacencies of programs in the generator project. But at the same time, for the pa Fun Palace project, you have his questionnaires that say, do you suffer from success, from failure, from education, freedom, love, hate, indifference, lack of privacy? Or he would go, you know, and give out this says, that says, does the past bother you or uh, concern you, whether God is dead? What, better, getting older, wiser, better, worse, richer, poorer. And I think for me, this kind of um, understanding that architecture has an expanded sensorium that goes beyond the, the, the mere uh, physical and measurable and quantifiable is something that is really, really great. At the same time, you know, projects like the Fun Palace in their very first stages are not published in the AD or in other architectural journals, but are published in um, New Scientist, for example, a, a British journal. But there, the project is presented not as a laboratory in the serious, you know, a dead serious term, but as a laboratory of fun, as a place where things are tested and have a dimension beyond, um, you know, the, the, the very rudimentary um, uh, aspects that I just showed. And uh, I will end with one clip from his, uh, a film that he produced for uh, the discussing the um, uh, Fun Palace project which features these three actors dressed up in Arlequin or, uh, um, you know, um, suits. And you see one, one of the uh, actors is holding this huge oversized beaker with bubbling water and smoke coming out. And I find it really fascinating that the whole film, which is like a 15 film of um, dancing and, and cheering and choreography, starts with this accident. It starts with a moment of failure. It starts with a moment where things are destabilized and gone wrong. Uh, rather than with a kind of triumphant idea of uh, linearity and success. So it's been really a kind of uh, pleasure to, 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 to and, and honor to imagine that uh, Price himself had created an exhibition at the very same space in the Octagonal Gallery in 1999. And I hope that uh, what I have shared with you today uh, about the intersections and juxtapositions of architectural science can help us see a bit beyond the cult in order to be able to critically reimagine new ways of combining these two fields together for both research and practice in architecture. And I would like to, you know, I'm not going to read the names, all of, all of them here. I'm very grateful to the team that made this uh, project uh, uh, um, a reality and uh, all the hard effort that has been gone into it. Um, there were moments that I felt that I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but Giovanna uh, Borazzi told me that this is precisely what we want, so I just continued doing that. So I would like to thank all of them, especially he Helena, Anne, Louise, Sebastian, Jim, Lev, Isabel, Julia, Francesco, Giovanna, Mirko, and I would like also to very much thank Madame Lambert for two reasons. One is for writing an angry letter in 1954 that started with no, 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 no. And the second for creating the CCA, uh, which is a space where um, accidents like this are allowed to happen. Thank you. <laughs>